thousands of miles away from Tucson, on the Mediterranean island of Sardinia, lies an abandoned open pit gold mine that is creating serious environmental damage. What has happened over the last 15 years in the mountains above the farming village of Forte provides a cautionary tale of what could happen to the Santa Rita Mountains south of Tucson, Arizona. I'm investigative journalist John Doherty. I traveled to Sardinia, Italy, and discovered a direct connection between the Sardinian gold mines and the proposed Rosemont copper mine here in the Santa Rita Mountains, a story that's never been revealed until now. The same Canadian businessmen who directly contributed to an unfolding environmental crisis in Sardinia now want to build the Rosemont Copper Mine. Augusta Resource Corporation, a Canadian speculative mining company with posh offices overlooking downtown Vancouver's waterfront, owns the Rosemont Copper Company. Rosemont Copper, which is still seeking approvals for the proposed mine, is Augusta's only company. Augusta has never actually run a fully operational mine, but Augusta's top executives do have a mining history. Between 2003 and 2007, five of Augusta's current executives, Chairman Richard Wark, Donald Clark, Christopher Jennings, Robert Wares, and Augusta CEO Gil Clawson, sat on the board of directors of another mining company, Sargold Resource Corporation. Sargold owned the gold mine near Forte. Their actions as Sargold directors call into question their promises that Augusta's Rosemont mine will resurrect southern Arizona's economy and protect a cherished mountain range and a critical drinking water source for southern Arizona. These same Augusta executives made similar promises in Sardinia, promises that were later broken. The fertile farming valley near Forte has sustained the local economy for centuries, but in recent years, farming alone hasn't created enough jobs. Despite the dire need for jobs, Sardinia residents worried about what open pit gold mining would do to the land and water near Forte. Sardinian journalist Antonio Pintori has written extensively about the mine's impact on Forte and Sardinia. The worry was about the effects on the environment. They come here and open this big mine, extract gold, but then, from the environmental point of view, what happens? Especially after everything is done, what are they going to leave us? Former gold mine worker Ignazio Corda. Well, here there were no job opportunities. So I had to take this or nothing. So we struggled to accept the mine. Mining first began in 1997, when four open pit gold mines were dug into the highlands overlooking Forte and Valley Farms. Mountains were blasted and tons of ore hauled away, transforming peaks into craters. A hillside was stripped away next to a primary irrigation and drinking water reservoir that serves southern Sardinia. Mine waste rock unleashing a highly acidic, toxic stew of dangerous chemicals and metals, including arsenic, cascades down a mountainside. Today, winds continue to blow contaminated dust from the rock pile into the nearby reservoir and onto crops in the valley below. Poisonous liquid waste is pumped into a massive cyanide-contaminated tailings pond perched high in the mountains above Forte, an ecological time bomb that residents call Cyanide Beach. For all of the irreparable destruction done to the land, the mines extracted gold for less than a decade. Sargold acquired the Sardinian gold mine in 2003 from an Australian company that had already extracted the most accessible and profitable gold. Under its chairman, Richard Wark, Sargold assumed responsibility for environmental restoration of the mine site. But instead of cleaning up the site, Sargold's executives used their obligation to protect Sardinia's land and water as leverage in negotiations to gain mining rights elsewhere in Sardinia. 
Sardinia's former president, Renato Soru, supported local residents and demanded that Sargold complete environmental restoration in Forte before the company developed mines elsewhere, including the historic town of Asilo in northern Sardinia. Sardinian journalist Antonio Pintori was present during the negotiations between President Saru and Sargold. So they argued this, we can restore the work here only if you give us the mining concessions for Asilo. And Saru said, okay, before we discuss new concessions and mines, first fix the areas you devastated here in Forte. A standoff ensued. Sargold began restoration work on only one of the four open pits in Forte, but the company never gained mining rights elsewhere in Sardinia, so cleanup in Forte was scaled back. At that point, Sargold's only mining option was in Forte, but the company's executives knew from the previous owners that most of the gold had already been mined. They also knew the gold that remained was embedded in rock formations that were expensive to process. But Sargold's executives dismissed the serious problems in Sardinia, telling investors in press releases that its exploratory drilling in Porte had discovered new, high-grade deposits of gold. Sargold's directors significantly overstated the known gold reserves in a 2003 press release. When the Toronto Venture Stock Exchange discovered this, it forced Sargold, then known as Canley Developments, to retract the inflated gold projection to protect investors from being duped. Then, in March 2007, Sargold, whose financial condition was worsening, told investors it had discovered a breakthrough process that could cheaply separate the gold from the problematic ore. Three months later, in yet another press release, Sargold claimed it would begin producing 50,000 ounces of gold annually for the next five years. But the company never developed the deposit nor did it use the breakthrough gold extraction process. In fact, Sargold merely reprocessed some old waste rock and produced a scant 1,300 ounces of gold in 2007. My research of Sargold's financial records reveals by early 2007, the company was more than $1.5 million behind in payments to local contractors, forcing vendors to obtain court judgments. Sargold's executives had also misspent a $700,000 Sardinian government loan that was supposed to be used to develop an underground mine in Forte. The cash crisis was so serious that Sargold's top executives made personal loans to the company to keep it going, even as they continued to issue overly optimistic press releases. Altogether, Sargold lost $7 million in the four years it owned the Sardinian mine. Most of Sargold's money, including executive salaries, came not from actual mining, but from stocks sold on the Toronto and Frankfurt stock exchanges and in private offerings. Yet, during most of the period Sargold owned the Sardinian mine, its investors were kept in the dark about two key pieces of information required to be disclosed by Canadian regulators. Sargold chairman Richard Wark, Augustus' current chairman, did not disclose at the time that he had filed personal bankruptcy in 1998. Sargold also failed to disclose to its shareholders in its annual proxy statements from 2005 through 2007 that a Cayman Islands hedge fund called RAB Special Situations controlled more than 10% of the company's stock. In October 2007, despite its serious financial problems and limited gold prospects, Sargold's directors negotiated a friendly merger with Buffalo Gold Limited, another Vancouver-based speculative mining company. Sargold's shareholders, including Wark, retained a 25% share in Buffalo Gold while reaping a premium for their Sargold stock. Over the next year, difficult mining conditions in Sardinia led to more losses, $5 million in all. In December 2008, Buffalo Gold abandoned the mine, environmental restoration, the workers, and the people of Forte. The Canadians left behind rusting mining equipment, five tons of toxic chemicals, including cyanide, unreclaimed mining pits, and a massive leaking tailings dump full of cyanide-laced mud. The Sardinian government estimates it will cost more than 16 million euro, or $20 million, 
to clean up the contaminated mine site and waste dump. Italian taxpayers will pay to clean up the mess. The unfolding environmental crisis in Sardinia undercuts the promises now being made about the Rosemont Copper Mine, promises made by the same executives who are now running Augusta. Augusta claims the mile-wide, half-mile-deep copper pit it wants to blast into the eastern crest of the Santa Rita Mountains and the 70-story high tailing piles that will spread across more than 3,000 acres of national forest will, quote, incorporate progressive reclamation practices from the first year of mining activity. Augusta Resource touts the exceptional experience and strength of Augusta's management team as reason for the public and investors to trust and support the Rosemont Copper Mine. And at the end, it'll be an operation that we can bring people from all over the world to see. It'll be a state-of-the-art mine. But the Santa Ritas are not just another isolated, barren mountain range lost in the vast Sonoran Desert. Runoff and springs from the Santa Ritas provide water to the Los Cienegas National Conservation Area that includes a rare, shallow aquifer protected by the U.S. Bureau of Land Management. The mountains host ancient Native American cultural sites and provide suitable habitat for endangered species, including the jaguar. The urban range provides important recreation and helps support a thriving billion-dollar Southern Arizona tourism industry. The Arizona Game and Fish Department says the mine will destroy the northern half of the mountain range, leaving it worthless for wildlife, recreation, hunting, and other outdoor activities. Should the public accept at face value Augusta's bold promise that the Rosemont copper mine will somehow be different than other open pit copper mines that have laid waste to vast areas of Arizona? Forte Mayor Luciano Cal is closely monitoring an ongoing series of reports about the pollution left behind after the gold mine was abandoned. We have pretty serious environmental problems. The Sardinian Regional Environmental Agency, EJA, has taken over the deserted mine site and is now conducting a $5.7 million study in hopes of trying to repair some of the devastation. The most serious problem is at Cyanide Beach. Contaminated water from the abandoned mining pits is pumped up to Cyanide Beach. It is anything but secure. Arsenic and cyanide-laced mud seeps through an earthen dam into a retention basin. A pump captures the poisonous drainage and lifts it back into Cyanide Beach. Without the pump, local officials fear the groundwater will be contaminated. The problem is that every time it rains, there is the danger of overflow. There is always a constant danger that it could overflow. It ends up here. There is a valley that channels the waters. And this is another dam of clean water that takes drinking water to Kaidi and surrounding areas to roughly 600,000 people. Everyone knew it was critical to maintain the pump and monitor the dam. But the Canadians ignored the danger when they abandoned the site, forcing former mine employees to maintain the pump around the clock without pay. Il, um, il problema... The problem with the F-25 basin occurred when the Canadians left. The mine was for sale, and there was not tight inspections. And if the pump would break, it wasn't like before anymore, when there was money to call the engineer to fix it. Volunteers included Sandro Broey, former gold mines of Sardinia director of labor and production. Yes. As soon as they left, yes, we kept working. We were all former employees. There were about 15 to 17 of us. During heavy winter rains in February and March 2010, headlines appeared in the Sardinian press predicting catastrophe at the mine site. Former mine workers staged a sit-in at government buildings, warning of serious environmental problems and demanding to be put back to work to clean up the site. At one point, the pump failed. The former mine employees managed to fix the pump. 
The people of Forte and southern Sardinia never expected to be left with an environmental mess of this magnitude. They knew there would be damage, but expected the mining companies to do more to protect their land and their water. Town Councilman Andrea Nonis. We were expecting that the price of the environmental disaster would have been averted with the restoration. Today, even with record high gold prices, far higher than the $800 an ounce gold was selling for in December 2008, Forte's leaders are no longer interested in digging for an underground load of gold known to exist. <laughs> Absolutely not. Mayor Cow. Last year, another company came that was interested in reestablishing the mine. At this point, we said no, because this big area of our territory, which has pretty important Mediterranean nature, needs to be restored for the future generations. It should get back to the way it used to be. I traveled to Vancouver and requested a meeting with Augusta executives who served on the Sargold board, but they declined repeated requests to be interviewed for this report. In a written statement that dodges Augusta's executives' role in Sargold, the company said, quote, Augusta has never had any involvement with Sargold Resource Corporation. In October 2007, Sargold was acquired by Buffalo Gold Limited. Therefore, the members of Augusta management and board will not be engaging with you in any discussion regarding Sargold. While Augusta's executives are shirking responsibility for their actions in Sardinia, Franco Kerki, the former president of Sargold's Gold Mines of Sardinia subsidiary, did provide extensive comments on Sargold's mining operations. Interviewed in his office in the historic coal mining town of Iglesias, about an hour west of Forte, Kerki says that placing a mine in an important natural resource area like the Santa Rita Mountains is not a good idea. No, no, perché uh, a mine perché is always invasive. Kerki reported directly to Sargold's chairman, Richard Wark, from December 2004 until early 2006. Kerki was impressed with Wark's ability to raise money through the stock market. I say he was clever. From the point of view of a businessman who plays the stock market, he was very good. Wark's cleverness includes his repeated failure to disclose required information to Canadian regulators, including his personal bankruptcy. In December 2011, Save the Scenic Santa Rita's, a Tucson-based environmental group opposed to the Rosemont Copper Mine, filed a formal complaint with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and the British Columbia Securities Commission over Mr. Wark's apparent failure to disclose required information in public filings, not only for Sargold, but also Augusta. If Augusta is failing to disclose critical required information to investors, what does that say about the many other promises that it is making regarding the proposed Rosemont mine? Kierke is also skeptical of any promises that work makes. When it's not convenient for him anymore, he withdraws the promise. Work, Kierke says, is only interested in making money. He must see business in it. He's a speculator. Mayor Cow is convinced that Sargold was merely using the Forte gold mines as a lure to sell stock in order to expand mining operations elsewhere in Sardinia. The gold mines of Forte were a way to get to the stock market. Here in Arizona, Augusta Executive's plans to blast a giant hole in these mountains is running into the same issues they faced in Sardinia, broad-based community opposition and deteriorating finances. Augusta has encountered fierce opposition from local residents, ranchers and farmers, two southern Arizona county governments, and from businesses, large and small. To counter the opposition, Augusta has launched an expensive and misleading public relations campaign claiming that the Rosemont mine would reduce America's dependence on foreign copper. Augusta, however, 
states in an August report filed with Canadian regulators that 50% of its copper is already committed to London and Korean-based companies. Augusta also says that it is in active negotiations with several major international smelters in Asia and Europe for the sale of the remaining uncommitted production. Augusta's chairman, Gil Clausen, has also repeatedly told local media that Rosemont has no intention of expanding the mine site to include claims on the top and western side of the Santa Rita Mountains, where they would be seen from Green Valley and Sarita. But Augusta is telling its investors a different story. Augusta stated in its August regulatory filing that one of the claims could be added as, quote, a satellite development to the Rosemont project. The company's misleading statements come at the same time a U.S. regulator is opposing the Rosemont mine. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, in February 2012, sharply criticized Augusta's draft environmental impact statement, concluding the mine's current design should not be approved by the U.S. Forest Service. EPA's concerns suggest a long permitting battle ahead. One prominent financial analyst who tracks Augusta is now forecasting that the Rosemont mine will not start production until 2015. Delays mean more trouble for Augusta. Augusta's main source of money to cover upfront expenses over the last two years has come from a $70 million commitment by its joint venture partner, Korea-based United Copper and Mali. But pre-mining expenses have continued to mount, forcing Augusta to spend more than $25 million of its own funds since October 2011, cutting deeply into its cash reserves. Augusta's financial reports show the company is in a cash flow squeeze with only $9.6 million cash on hand at the end of June and projected expenses of $35 million for environmental permitting, engineering, purchase of mining equipment, and ongoing operations through the end of 2012. Augusta's cash flow crisis was temporarily averted in mid-August when it borrowed an additional $40 million. Augusta now owes $83 million to a London-based hedge fund. Augusta, with 144 million shares of stock outstanding, remains a highly diluted, heavily leveraged company with no revenue and an uncertain regulatory outlook. Despite the uncertainties, Augusta's top five executives haven't slashed spending. Instead, they dramatically increased their compensation, drawing more than $5.9 million in salary and stock benefits in 2011, up 127% from 2010. This maneuver suggests Augusta's executives are cashing in while they can. In Sardinia, Mr. Wark and his partners held the environment hostage hyped the value of a depleted gold mine, stiffed local contractors, and misspent a government loan. In the end, Sargold's executives reaped millions of dollars, while Sardinia was left with an abandoned gold mine and an environmental mess that Italian taxpayers are having to pay to clean up. Meanwhile, in Arizona, Augusta is grossly exaggerating the economic impact of the Rosemont mine claiming its 400 jobs, which is less than one-tenth of one percent of Southern Arizona's job total, will somehow single-handedly transform the regional economy. Augusta even goes so far as to promise its massive open-pit mine and waste rocks spread across more than 4.5 square miles will be built without permanently damaging the Santa Rita Mountains and threatening a critical Sonoran Desert water supply. Such assurances ring hollow coming from Augusta, a company that includes five directors who used environmental restoration as a bargaining chip and walked away from the disaster they contributed to in Sardinia. More importantly, can Mr. Wark be trusted to deliver on his pledge to build the world's most environmentally advanced mine here on the Coronado National Forest? Or will American taxpayers get stuck with paying to clean up another cyanide beach? <laughs>